What an amazing person B.S. Skinner was. He had this very long life, worked till the very end of his days, and he really changed the way psychology was done in the 20th century. He introduced theory, methods, he even wrote a novel or two, like this one here, Walden 2, which is a utopian novel in which he shows what it would be like if you actually followed his psychological principles and his analysis of behavior. I have my own personal connections to B.F. Skinner that I'll talk about at the end of this video, two kind of ways that he crossed paths with me in the sense that, you know, I was lucky enough that there was part of my life overlapped with his. But before we get to that, let's go ahead and talk now about Skinner. Boris Frederick Skinner, who lived from 1904 to 1990, and he's also known as B.F. Skinner, and the F is actually short for Fred. B.F. Skinner was born in 1904 in the small railroading town of Susquehanna, Pennsylvania in the United States. His father was a self-taught lawyer who never attended college and passed his bar examination after one year at law school, and was also a persuasive speaker and author of a well-regarded textbook on workman's compensation. Skinner described his mother as bright and beautiful, a good singer, and a second-ranked student in her high school class. Skinner wrote, I was taught to fear God, the police, and what people will think. As a result, I usually do what I have to do with no great struggle. Growing up, Skinner was interested in music. He was also interested in creating inventions, such as a contraption reminding him to keep his room neat. He had a special hook in the closet of my room that was connected by a string and pulley system to a sign hanging above the door to the room. When my pajamas were off the hook, the sign hung squarely in the middle of the door frame and it read, hang up your pajamas. Skinner published his first literary work at the age of 10, a poem entitled That Pessimistic Fellow in the Lone Scout magazine. Unpublished works written during high school included a morality play featuring the characters greed, gluttony, jealousy, and youth, and a novel about a young naturalist's love affair with the daughter of a dying trapper. So you can see he was quite a writer, quite literary, and read a lot. So he did very well academically, and in 1922, he became the first person in his family to go off to college or university, and he went to Hamilton College in Clinton, New York. At Hamilton, Skinner took some biology courses and a philosophy course taught by a former student of Wundt's, but he never took a psychology course. He majored in English and he wrote regularly for the college newspaper, a literary magazine, and a humor magazine, and he adopted the pen name Cerberus Dibiris for the last. He was a practical joker. He once helped spread a false rumor that Charlie Chaplin was coming to campus and was going to be speaking. And after a large crowd gathered for the event and were disappointed when Charlie Chaplin didn't show up, Skinner wrote an editorial in the school newspaper declaring, no man with the slightest regard for his alma mater could have done such a thing. After graduation, Skinner moved into his parents' home in Scranton, Pennsylvania. He built a study in the attic and tried to settle in and write professionally. He later called this time his dark year as he experienced loneliness, depression, and severe writer's block. He read great literature, but found little to say about it. He tried to write about writing, but that seemed empty. As he later put it, the truth was, I had no reason to write anything. I had nothing to say, and nothing about my life was making any change in that condition. And at this point in his life, he encountered behaviorism. Skinner had read a book in which philosopher Bertrand Russell, one of his favorite writers, discussed John B. Watson's recently published book, Behaviorism. Russell wrote, I do not fundamentally agree with Watson's view, but I think it contains much more truth than most people suppose, and I regard it as desirable to develop the behaviorist method to the fullest extent. Intrigued, Skinner read Watson as well, and also read the recently translated Pavlov, liked it all, and began to suspect that behavioristic analyses might just be able to account for many of those whys of behavior that were missing in literature. He thus became resolved to go to graduate school and become a behaviorist psychologist. He applied and was accepted at Harvard and started in fall 1920. The Harvard psychology department wasn't particularly strong in behaviorism, but Skinner found a few fellow graduate students who shared his interests and the faculty who allowed him to go on his own way. He didn't really have a very well-known mentor at this time. It seems to be that he was pretty much on his own in terms of guiding his own interests and his own research. 
During the eight years between 1928 and 1936, first as a graduate student and then as a postdoctoral fellow, and finally as a junior fellow in Harvard's prestigious Society of Fellows, Skinner laid the groundwork for this whole new kind of behavioristic analysis. In 1936, just as he was finishing his time at Harvard, he married Yvonne Eve Blue, and they eventually had two daughters. Now let's talk a little bit more about what was happening while he was at Harvard doing his PhD and his postdoctoral work. This is when, like I said, he developed his own version of behaviorism. He discovered what he called later operant conditioning accidentally. He had actually been working on developing a, a box, an apparatus that would help him study the salivary reflex apparatus that Pavlov was interested in. He was trying to study this as well. And he described this in an article called A Case History and Scientific Method that was actually funny. He talked about four unformalized principles of scientific practice in his little article. He said, one, when you run into something interesting, drop everything else and study it. The box that he ended up with was the end result of a long series of partly completed experiments that had been abandoned in mid-course that just didn't work out. Two, he said some ways of doing research are easier than others. The box was highly automated and it required a little work by the experimenter once the animal subject was placed inside. In fact, oftentimes what he liked to do was just go off, leave his box there with his animal in it, and he could go off someplace else and maybe play the violin. He said three, the apparatus sometimes break down, and some of the things that he discovered happened to be when the apparatus didn't actually work correctly. And four, some people are lucky. Some of his most interesting results occurred accidentally or when the apparatus malfunctioned. Now besides these principles, Skinner was also inspired by a major guiding air idea. He had admired this precision that Pavlov brought to the study of conditioned reflexes, and he appreciated Watson's attempts to extend the concept of conditioned reflexes into explanations of emotions, but still something seemed lacking. He wrote, I could not move without a jolt from salivary reflexes to the important business of the organism in everyday life. So for him, learning in everyday life involved more than just passive acquisitions of reflexive reactions to stimuli that are essentially inflicted upon the organism from the outside. He thought that normal organisms also learn to actively manipulate, control, and operate upon their environments. Thorndike's chickens and cats had demonstrated this type of learning when they had escaped confinement back in his PhD work in the late 1890s. So Skinner devised his box to enable him to study actively acquired learning even more systematically. His box was essentially a white rat's cage with a lever bar mounted on one wall near a food tray and connected to a mechanism that dropped a food pellet into the tray when the bar was pressed. Each press of the bar also caused a pen mechanism touching a constantly moving roll of paper to rise by a small fixed amount so that a permanent cumulative record of all of the bar pressers could be kept. Such cumulative records resembled mathematical curves whose steepness reflected the rates of responding. When the rates were low, there were very few pen elevations and the record remained flat. Higher rates produced curves with steeper slopes. At first the rate was low as the animal explored its new environment. After the first few presses were reinforced with food, however, the rate increased dramatically and continued as high as long as the rat remained hungry. In further experiments, Skinner varied the contingencies of reinforcement, the specific conditions under which these responses were reinforced or not with food pellets. One experiment occurred by chance when the food dispenser jammed after an animal had already been regularly reinforced and established a steady response rate. The cumulative record showed an extinction curve. At first, the animal responded at a very high rate, partly because it was no longer pausing between responses to eat, and partly because of an emotional or frustrated activation of the response. After a few minutes, however, the rate slowed down except for a series of progressively diminishing wave-like bursts of response. And finally, the curve flattened out almost completely, indicating that the response was almost never repeated. That is, it had been extinguished. Other experiments varied the contingencies of reinforcement by providing food pellets only intermittently, according to several different reinforcement schedulers. On a fixed interval reinforcement schedule, for example, reinforcement only came on the first response following a predetermined period of time, regardless of how many responses have been in the interim. Fixed ratio, variable interval, variable ratio, you've heard of all these before in your other courses. And as casino owners well know, such variable schedules 
can produce very high rates of response that are remarkably resistant to extinction. After being placed on these schedules, Skinner's animals responded for much longer after reinforcement was cut off altogether than they would have if the original schedule had just been regular. Skinner saw the rat's bar pressing behavior as conveniently representing a whole range of learned behaviors by animals and humans in the real world and, in his words, they operate on the environment to produce various ends. So you can see where operant comes from. He's talking about how the organism operates on the environment to have responses happen. When he published these results in his first book, The Behavior of Organisms, in 1938, he established that operant conditioning was a kind of learning distinctly different from the Pavlovian conditioned reflex, but equally as important. He referred to the general Pavlovian type of learning as respondent learning, and contrasted it with operant conditioning on several dimensions. Respondent conditioning creates completely new connections between stimuli and responses, for example, whereas operant conditioning strengthens or weakens responsive tendencies that already exist in the organism's repertoire. Well, after laying the foundations for the study of operant conditioning at Harvard, Skinner taught at the University of Minnesota and Indiana University for 12 years before returning permanently to Harvard in 1948. In fact, he stayed there at Harvard to the end of his life. Over the years, he started to attract followers who were able, who were interested in applying these techniques and these findings of operant conditioning to a wide variety of experimental and practical situations. And they ended up creating a separate division of the American Psychological Association devoted to it called the Experimental Analysis of Behavior. Skinner himself became increasingly concerned with the practical applications and philosophical implications of his work. One of these applications had to do with things that happened in his own life, things that he had noticed about his home life. And one of those was when he had children, that when, for instance, his wife Yvonne gave birth to his second daughter, Deborah, he thought of ways he might better care for his girl. So in his basement, he built a crib enclosed completely in safety glass and included a thermostat. And in 1945, he would try to market it and he called it the hair conditioner. He had noticed how hard it was for the bundle Deborah to turn over, and in this air conditioner, Deborah could always be in a diaper, allowing for total movement within the unit. Air that entered was moistened, sound was absorbed by the walls. The device's sole purpose was just to provide a comfortable and safe environment for the infant, and it compared favorably on both scores to traditional cribs. So they went out to try to market this. That is, Skinner wanted to see if some companies would take up his idea here for this crib. Now, because the child was totally contained in the system, General Mills, one of the big corporations that looked at it, feared what would happen if the climate apparatus were to fail. Perhaps the child would become overheated or frozen. So after the company passed on the air conditioner, he decided to publicize his invention through an article in Ladies Home Journal entitled Baby in a Box. You can see here in the photos that on the left, we actually have his wife, Yvonne, Eve, with Deborah in the hair conditioner they had in the upstairs, probably in the kitchen. Over on the right, you can see when they started to market this as a product. You can see also that there's a kind of a roll of paper there down at the bottom. And this is actually an idea that he got out of working with his Skinner boxes, that if there was anything that was soiled or dirty about the bottom of the container from the child, you could just roll out some paper there and have some fresh paper underneath there that the kid could have that would keep it nice and clean. When he published this article in Ladies Home Journal called Baby in a Box, he wasn't actually responsible for the article's title. He said later that the word box led to countless confusion because I had used another box in a study of operant conditioning, and they assumed I was experimenting on our daughter as if she were a rat or a pigeon. Um, and in fact, the problem here was that he wasn't really actually doing any conditioning. It was just really, like I said, a safety place. And despite this poor word of mouth, he got a manufacturer interested in it and they started to manufacture it. But because of the device's high cost, it co cost over $300 to fabricate at that time. It was never successfully produced on any real scale. Skinner developed methods for building up complex sequences of simple responses in animals. He used respondent or Pavlovian conditioning to pair the sound of clicks from a toy clicker with a strong primary reinforcer such as food. After a while, the clicks themselves became effective secondary reinforcers, as demonstrated by the fact that the animals would maintain high rates in a Skinner box. He then used his secondary reinforcer to progressively shape increasingly complicated chains of responses, 
Training pigeons to perform some spectacular feats such as rolling a ball back and forth across the table in a rudimentary form of ping pong. Skinner's interest in automating teaching led him to develop programmed instruction, where complicated subjects such as mathematics were broken down into simple stepwise components that could be represented to students in order of increasing difficulty. The beginning student would answer an easy question about the simplest component and learn if the response was right or wrong. Correct responses were strengthened, while incorrect answers were followed by reviews and supplementary instructions that provided the small amount of new information necessary for success on the next try. Skinner's teaching machine was set up in the basement of several Harvard halls to test on students. IBM became interested in producing the device, but backed out after researching the market. Despite this setback, operant teaching programs based on Skinner's methods are all around us in education today. Even though Skinner's ideas extended to computers, he himself never actually learned to use a computer in his lifetime. He constantly thought about the philosophical as well as the practical implications of his theory. Skinner's view of freedom and free will was a controversial topic. He concluded that virtually all behavior could be controlled by the contingencies of reinforcement, meaning that the concept of free will must be an illusion. Skinner argued that when we believe we are acting freely, we are merely free of negative reinforcement or its threat and are fully determined instead by the pursuit of things that have reinforced us positively in the past. When we feel other people are behaving freely, we are simply unaware of their complete reinforcement histories and the contingencies that shape their behavior. Skinner was also a prolific writer and published many books on his theories and ideas. One of his most famous books is Walden II, a novel that presents a utopian vision of a society based on the principles of behaviorism. In the novel, the society is organized around a system of rewards and punishments and individuals are conditioned to behave in certain ways to benefit the greater good of the community. Skinner's book Beyond Freedom and Dignity, a nonfiction book, proposed that the most effective way to create a happy and productive society was to eliminate the concept of free will altogether. He argued that people could be shaped and controlled through positive reinforcement rather than relying on punishment and negative reinforcement. There are quite a few interviews that you can find with Skinner on YouTube. I found an interview with Skinner that was conducted in the early 70s here, probably right after Beyond Freedom and Dignity came out in 1971. I've put a link to this video in my description below. Because we are misunderstanding what we mean by freedom and dignity and it's standing in our way. Many of the people who reviewed my book have mentioned rats in mazes or dogs and dinner bells. If that's what I was talking about, if it's not, it's quite surprising to me now, looking back on it, how little uh, the world in general knows about operant conditioning, and I would include many psychologists. It's an extremely advanced, rigorous science. Just there are that, hundreds of laboratories throughout the world that are doing this work. Just how free is man? Well, of course, it depends on what you mean by freedom. I think traditionally the struggle for freedom has been concerned with freeing men from what we call aversive events, punitive events, annoying events, discomfort, and that kind of thing. And I'm all for that. I wouldn't change it. I would not deprive man of that kind of freedom. I think he could do a very much better job, however, in living a day in his life free of threatening, coercive, punitive uh, control. That was, that was fine. And I think when you have to free the individual from despots, tyrants, people who, uh, who control through punitive methods, the best way to, is to build up the individual, to convince him that he can be free, that the power derives from him, which is being used against him, and so on. I'm all for that. I'm all for building the individual up. As I finish up on Skinner, I wanted to share with you some personal notes about him as my life was touched twice by Skinner. The first time happened in 1981 when I was a freshman at university. I was taking a mandatory writing class in my first semester in which we had to read an article by Skinner and then write an essay about it. One of my classmates was having a hard time understanding this article that Skinner had wrote, so he decided one day to just call the Harvard Psychology Department and ask for Professor Skinner. According to some accounts I've heard about over the years, Skinner used to come to his office every workday even after he retired in 1970. 
So when my classmate called Skinner's office, he answered the phone and proceeded to politely answer my classmate's questions about the article. He actually seemed to enjoy discussing all these ideas that my fellow classmate was having. When my friend later told me this story, my jaw dropped as a psychology major. I was aware of how famous Skinner was. He was perhaps the most famous psychologist alive, and I would never have thought to bother B.F. Skinner for a question for one of my assignments. But my classmate, who is not a psychology student, really had no idea who he was and just thought he was a nice man. The second time I had a Skinner encounter was in 1990. Skinner was diagnosed with leukemia in 1989 at the age of 85, and he didn't have too long to live in 1990 when the American Psychological Association was having its annual meeting in Boston, which was Skinner's hometown. And I happened to go to this meeting. It was my first APA meeting. Skinner and a few other famous psychologists were there to receive Lifetime Achievement Awards. So I went to the ceremony in which Skinner was going to receive his. I remember him looking frail, but he went ahead and stood up and delivered a speech about what he thought was the unfortunate growth of cognitive psychology. One of his colleagues at Harvard, George Miller, a cognitive psychologist who was also receiving one of these Lifetime Achievement Awards, was sitting behind him on stage. He's the guy who came up with that 7 plus or minus 2 rule for the number of bits of information that you can hold in your short-term memory. Anyway, as Skinner got all heated up about cognitive psychology in his speech, I remember looking back at Miller, who was grinning the whole time, as if he had heard these rantings many times before in the psychology department at Harvard. At the end of that speech, there was a standing ovation when Skinner finished, and sadly, eight days later, he passed away. B.F. Skinner was a prominent psychologist who made significant contributions to the field of psychology through his research on conditioning, his development of programmed instruction, and his philosophical ideas. His work on behaviorism and his rejection of free will remain controversial to this day, but his ideas continue to influence psychology and education. Well, I hope you enjoyed learning more about B.F. Skinner and maybe have a deeper appreciation of what it was that he contributed to psychology. In fact, if you like this video, could you please consider giving it a like? And maybe you want to even subscribe to my channel because I'll be continuing to put out more and more content like this in the future. In fact, I have a video right now that you could watch about behaviorism. It's a short overall view of behaviorism and how Skinner fits in. Otherwise, I'll see you later. Thank you very much for watching.